and let me make that small. Okay, stage theories. So before we get into them, I want to talk about some basic stuff about stage theories because, like I said, we're going to cover a few of them. We're going to go about three principles, and the first one is that stages are cumulative and gradual. So we all know what cumulative means, right? Um, like the little meme there, we've had cumulative exams. So cumulative means what you learn at stage one builds to stage two and stage three, and eventually by the end you've learned all kinds of things because it's all added up. It's summative. But stages are also gradual and slow. When you look at a stage theory, you tend to want to think that, okay, so today I'm in stage one, but tomorrow I might be in stage two. Technically, it can take years to go from one stage to the next, so they are quite gradual. Um, also, stages represent what we call a qualitative change, and this is a big deal. This is really the crux of a stage theory. This, the changes are qualitative, not quantitative. Now, what that means is from one stage to the next, you're looking at changes in traits, changes in characteristics, not just changes in amounts, meaning not just looking at the fact that you're five feet one day and five foot two inches the next day. It has to be an actual shift. For instance, I thought this graph could help and hopefully you can see my little cursor. This chart represents a change in quantity. So this is actually your self-esteem. And if you've already done the module looking at self-development, you've probably seen this, that self-esteem is really high when you're young, it drops down in puberty, it kind of, you know, goes up and down, but it's still just self-esteem. You're just high or low in it. Over here is quality, that at each stage you differ in traits, you differ in characteristics. Um, so from one stage to the next, you're quite different. This cartoon is silly, but I really think it makes the point. So it says we're looking at Teddy here, this little lion cub. Teddy longed for that coming of age moment when he could feast with the adult lions. Until then, he would sit at the fold away table card at the fold away card table with the rest of the cubs. How does that relate? Being at the kids table at Thanksgiving. I mean, how many of you had a kids table? The kids table was qualitatively different from the adult table. Now, if it was a quantitative difference, the only difference would be age five to age 35. A qualitative difference means difference in traits. They're eating different food, different manners are expected, different conversation is there, that sort of thing. Here's another example of a qualitative change. So if I were to ask you which row has more squares, the top row or the bottom row, think to yourself which one you'd pick. If you wanted to be super sure, would you maybe count them up? Like just quickly go six and six, okay, they're the same. Little kids wouldn't do that, especially under the age of five. A little kid would look at that and go, the top row has more. And you go, why does the top row have more? Well, look, they, they take up that much space, whereas the, the bottom row takes up this much space. They think very differently than we do. Okay, so the one of the last ones, we do not skip stages. We all go one, two, three, four. And the order doesn't usually change. Now, of course, Erickson is going to be an exception to that today. We're going to see there's a bit of a gender difference, but usually every single one of us go in the exact same order and we don't skip anything. Now, by the way, before I keep going on anymore, is anyone having any difficulty with the notes or with any technical issues? And again, I can see on my little chat here. If you're having any problems, let me know. I don't want to get too knee deep into this and have someone struggling. All right, Abby's doing good. All right, let me know if you got any problems or if there's something I need to do. I'm kind of new to this form too. All right, so that's it for stage theories. Good, James. Uh, now, Eric Erickson. And again, he's one of my favorites. So Erickson's whole theory is trying to look at how your social world makes you who you are. And, you know, Erickson also alone, he's an interesting guy. He started off studying Freud, but he pretty quickly found that Freud was brilliant, but a bit of a kook. And he felt like Freud emphasized sex far, far too much. And he said, you know what? I think the social world is what really impacts us. Parents, families, friends, schools, that's who makes us who we are. 
So that's what he's going to be looking at, the impact of our social world on who we are psychologically. That might ring a bell, ding, 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 to last week of Bronfenbrenner. So Bronfenbrenner's microsystem is a lot like what Erickson's talking about. Erickson just goes into a lot more detail about how people in those microsystem can affect you when you're an infant, a toddler, a preschooler, and all the way up. This is his theory that we're going to be looking at, but since for this class it's not a psychology course, we're just focusing about those school age years, we're just going to do the first five. And we'll also see how time goes. Hopefully we'll get everything covered. His theory is so whacked and so different because each stage is a conflict. That's why you'll notice on the previous slide it stated this versus that. So like a conflict at each stage. And how you resolve that conflict is a turning point in your own development. So <clears throat> if you succeed, you leave that stage with a healthy psychological trait. That's great. But you're not going to succeed at all of these stages. You're going to fail some. And when you fail, you leave with an unhealthy trait. I would like to point out success or failure often does not depend on you. It is about the people in your microsystem. So when you fail, it is most likely because someone in your microsystem failed you. Which again is kind of interesting. So if we go back. Oh, actually, I think I have this in the forward slide. So if we go back and look at his stage theory again, if you were to succeed at every one of his stages, let me describe you. You would trust in other people. You would be self-confident in your own abilities. You would be a good decision maker. You would have um, feel competent in your academic skills. You would know who you are, have great relations with others, feel productive in your life and feel good about the life you've led. OK, that's perfect. That's fabulous. I would love to aspire to that, but I can tell you right now I haven't succeeded all of these stages. You're going to see some that you failed as well, and that's OK because we're all capable of change. So these stages can be resolved later in life. So if you identify one of these areas that you have a weakness in or that you failed as an adult on your own, you can go back at any time and resolve these issues. I just like to point that out. All right, so here's my first question where I do want you to type into the chat. What do infants need from their caregivers? And I've given you this adorable little squishy little baby as a prompt. When you look at that little baby, what does that baby need from its caregivers? Any thoughts you have, type into the chat and I'll read them out if you can't see them. Let's see, a good example of intimacy, kindness, and trust from Theo. That's very true. Um, you know, especially, you know, we saw that first stage is about trust. So we're going to see that that's when infants really need to learn that they can trust their caregivers. Megan says love. Abby says comfort, basic necessities, intimacy, the ability to trust, protection. I agree with you, James, on all of the above. The uh, food and shelter. I mean, look at that little baby. That baby can't feed himself. He can't clothe himself. He can't take care of himself. Um, basically, they need everything from their caregiver. And because they need all of these things you guys just listed shows how they depend on us and have to learn to trust through the example that we give. So stage one is called trust versus mistrust. It is the first year of life. So technically, this is the infancy period. Uh, and this is where infants really require two big things, dependable care and comfort. So dependable care and comfort. <laughs> Hi, I love you. You got your food? All right, have a spot. Okay, you can sit wherever you want. Okay. You can pull up your stool if you want. All right, so dependable care and comfort. Here's a short video to kind of recap a little bit to introduce stage one. So again, that's just a nice visual introduction to this stage. So we know they need dependable care and comfort. 
success at this stage is great because what it leads to is a great bond with the caregiver. So if the, the caregiver, whomever it is, mother, father, aunt, uncle, if they feed the baby when they're hungry, give them milk when they are thirsty, clothe them when they need it, change them when they're dirty, they learn to trust that that caregiver is going to take care of them. Oh, Abby, you can't hear the audio on the video? Oh, that is good to know. So this is the first time that I'm trying doing a screen share um, this way. So it's possible, because I could hear the video, but it's possible that even though I'm sharing my screen, it doesn't share the audio. Okay. Thank you guys for letting me know. So what I might do on some of the future videos is while they're playing, since I know you can see them, I'll narrate or I'll skip them if I feel like they're not going to be too helpful that way. Okay, thanks, Abby. Okay, so again, if you succeed at this stage, they get this trusting, this great bond because they know my caregiver is there for me. But if they fail at this stage, and obviously if they fail, it's not the infant's fault. If they fail, it's because they did not get consistent, reliable care. They spent too much time hungry, too much time thirsty or dirty or crying and not being taken care of. That can lead to where they withdraw and where they feel fearful um, because they don't feel like someone's there to take care of them. All right, now this is not just a stagnant theory. This is a living, breathing thing that can affect parenting decisions as well as teaching decisions. Uh, when my daughter was in this age period, um, <laughs> um, she had a hard time sleeping alone at night. Now, before I had Sarah, I read all these books on sleep and all these great methods on how to get them to sleep alone in their bed, and that was my goal. And I really struggled with this because she would cry and she did not want to be alone at night. And I finally had this discussion with my husband. I said, okay, let's talk about Eric Erickson, okay? Erickson says she needs to know that we are there for her and that when she's upset, someone's going to be there for her and so on. And I said, you know what? If she's laying in that crib and crying and having a bad time, she might fail this stage because she feels like she needs her caregivers and she's not getting them. So eventually I gave up on my Ferber training and I just said, all right, you're going to snuggle with me and sleep with me if that's what makes you feel safe. So these things can impact real decisions you make. All right, so what happens if you do fail this stage? It's not just that you become a baby that doesn't trust your parents. This becomes an adult who doesn't trust anyone. So whether you're thinking about Dwight Schrute whether you're thinking about, uh, this is from an older movie called Black Book, I think, where she's always looking through her phone and thinking that her boyfriend is cheating on her, or whether you're a, you know, a conspiracy theorist. Most of these folks who are so distrusting of others failed stage one. They never learned to trust other people, not just their parents, but people in general. They don't think that anyone has their back, whether it be the government or their boyfriend. All right, stage two. Sarah, do you want to read our question? Pop your head in. No? Okay. So our question now for our chat is, now we're looking at toddlers. I got a picture of a cute little toddler there. How are toddlers different from infants? Are there certain things they're able to do? Um, are there things that they need differently? When you look at that toddler, how is he different from an infant? And I'll see if we have any thoughts on here. Do you have any thoughts on how a toddler is different from an infant? <laughs> no, not yet. Okay. Let's see. More freedom of movement. Yeah, because that baby's just laying there. They can't even pick up their heads at first. Um, they're more aware, more, vo more mobile and verbal, definitely. They can communicate directly and coherently. They show their personality. They exist more on their own term in terms of movement and communication. Yeah, they do exist more on their own. More independent. I mean, that little guy there is holding on his spoon and feeding himself, whereas the baby couldn't lift its head, couldn't do anything to get food if it was hungry. So, yeah, all of these are right. More movement, more independence, more control over things. Uh, you see their personality. They're talking more. Stage two is called autonomy versus shame and doubt. And this is a really interesting and kind of fun stage. So when I say toddler, I mean this is about age one to about age three. So these are our two-year-olds and our three-year-olds. 
if you've ever heard the phrase terrible twos or terrible threes, it's about this stage right here. Why? This is where the child is trying to do physical things for themselves. And I underlined the word physical because that's really what it's about. Can they feed themselves? Going to the bathroom on their own, putting their shirts on, um, painting, doing you can all the things represented in those pictures. This can be a challenge for parents. This is a messy stage. This is, can be a dangerous stage sometimes because they take a lot of risks while they're trying things. I saw this just last night on Facebook and I had to add it. Um, I think a lot of parents feel this way, language, a lot of parents feel this way with their toddlers when they see them climbing on tall things and swinging across things and oh, toddlers take a lot of risks. There is a lot of parental advice, which can also relate to if you plan on babysitting, nannying, working in a daycare, working with young kids for this stage. You do need to let them explore. You need to let them check their abilities. You need to have an encouraging environment for them to try to learn how to feed themselves and get dressed and do all these things, especially potty training. Potty training is the hardest skill that they're going to encounter here. So Michael Scott, the reason I've got this Michael Scott meme is because this is how a lot of parents feel in this stage. You're thinking, ah, I know I need to let them try it on their own, but it's so hard because it's so messy or I'm afraid they're going to get hurt, but it's essential to let them try. Um, these are some examples of some things you can see in the terrible twos and terrible threes. All these kids here were trying to do something for themselves and they ended up pretty bad, most of them. Now, I have to say, this is not what I'm talking about, what you need to do. You know, yes, obviously it's maybe an encouraging environment, but parents need to try to let them try out these skills within a careful way and teach them the right way to eat their jelly or play with their chocolate and not to do it on the couch. So there has to be restraints. You have to teach them the right way to do it while also teaching them to try things on their own. So there's a delicate balance needed from the caregiver to you don't want to do everything for them, but you also don't want to overly criticize them or make them feel bad for their failures. You know, so when they do have an accident, they're going to get food on themselves. They're going to get food on your floor. Um, they're still learning how to hold a spoon. They're still learning how to do these things. So you can't be overly critical about those sorts of um, mistakes that occur. And this one right here, try not to do everything for them. That's your helicopter parent, your parent that says, oh, no, no, I'm going to feed you till you're six years old or I'm going to dress you until you're eight years old. That doesn't let them do things for themselves. And if your parent always does those things for you, you'll never learn to do it for yourself. So that made me think of Finding Nemo. This is a short video that tries to connect this stage to Finding Nemo. Oh, and again, OK, so you don't have sound. So. I'm going to read your comment in just a second. So Nemo's dad always kept, um, restrained him due to his fin. Now here Nemo, Nemo is saying that he wants to go to the edge and look over his dad. I can't do anything, but I want to. My friends are doing that. And his dad is saying, you know, you can do that. You're not as capable as your friends because he's got one fin that is smaller than the other one. And Nemo gets upset. As he feels like his dad is constantly holding him back. Which is obviously going to make him feel Okay, let me read this comment here. So Haley's saying, I'm in my living room with my sister and her toddler as she is changing her diaper, telling her she needs to go on the potty. And as soon as you said potty training is the hardest, she said, yep. That is good. Potty training, you know, you start off thinking that potty training is going to be a couple of months. It can take years to do potty training. It is so challenging. So the aim of stage two needs to be self-control without losing self-esteem. That's a hard balance that you need to teach them, okay, this mess here in the bathroom, unacceptable. But you don't want them to feel too bad about it. So that balance of letting them try things without letting them go awry. So speaking of potty training, Haley, here's a question. How do you think a child feels after they master toilet training? Feel free if you want to 
even type in a word or two in here. What's like an emotion you might feel after a child masters potty training? How are they going to feel about themselves? Any thoughts? Well, I'm waiting to see. Oh, I hear a buzz. New messages, excitement. I agree with you. And I mean, look at that kid. He's going to feel like, yes, I did it. Especially if you've been spending years working on it. Pride, confidence, all of these work. And I love the word proud and pride because proud is that idea of I did it. I control that. I'm in charge of that now. And confident because then that pride leads to feeling good about your abilities. Okay, then how are they going to feel if they struggle and struggle and struggle and they just can't do it? I know probably the opposite of that, but I'll also wait and see if you type anything up here. Because there are a lot of kids who, if you try too soon to potty train them, you're spending years of them feeling like a failure because they just can't do it and you keep pushing and pushing them. So here we have frustrated, discouraged, feel like giving up, exhausted, disappointed, hopeless. Wow, you guys came up with a lot of great words. Because of this right here, that's why parents also have to really figure out when is the best time to do this. Now, Sarah doesn't like me talking about when she was little, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just say when we first started, I quickly realized, you know what? I'm pushing this too soon. I need to wait. So we took six months off and then we started again and then it was the perfect time. If I had kept pushing, she would have had six months of frustration and I don't think anybody likes that. So you got to find the right time. Uh, and if you were a fan of Rugrats growing up, you might recall that. So, you know, how the parent deals with things like potty training can determine whether the child ends up feeling bad or good about themselves. All right, so adding to stage two, if you succeed at this stage, the child feels control of themselves and they feel good about themselves or confidence. If you've already done the section on self-development, that is this week, they'll be talking about self-esteem and that kind of connects to this as well. So I love this. It says <clears throat> when mom asks if you need help pouring milk and you're saying, no, I got this because I'm in, you know, stage two. So they feel good about themselves. But if they fail, they end up feeling not good enough. Like they just can't do it. They just can't get the food on their fork. They can't go to the potty. They can't get their shirt on right. Um, which is why you really need to be there to try to scaffold those learning situations to help them have successes and to try to limit the number of frustrations and um, feelings of disappointment or inadequacy. So how does this manifest later in life? Because I like to point out this is not this doesn't just affect toddlers. Whether you succeed or fail affects you when you're older. I recall from one of the introduction videos, and I am still working on those, someone said that they love the movie Step Brothers. That's a perfect example of two guys who failed stage two, and they never learned to take care of themselves. And the reason they never learned to take care of themselves was because they, they had helicopter parents that did everything for them. 